Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast but don't have time to listen to every one, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. You're listening to the Urban Farm Podcast, your partner in the grow your own food revolution. Whether you've just been introduced to urban farming or you're a lifelong advocate, we're sure you'll leave feeling more informed, equipped, and empowered to dig deeper into the soil of your local food economy. With you every step of the way, here's your host, Greg Peterson. Today on the Urban Farm Podcast, we have Andrew Mefford to talk about his experience with hoop house and greenhouse growing. Andrew spent seven years in the research department at Johnny's Selected Seeds, traveling around the world to consult with researchers and farmers on best practices in greenhouse growing. He put what he learned to use in his own farm in Maine. And he is now the editor and publisher of Growing for Market magazine. Prior to starting his own farm, he worked on six farms across the United States. Andrew has also worked as a consultant on topics covered in his book, The Greenhouse and Hoop House Growers Handbook, Organic Vegetable Production Using Protected Culture, another great book published by Chelsea Green. Welcome to the show today, Andrew. Thanks so much, Greg. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at now? Yeah, sure. And and I think this the path that I took to farming shed some light on on um, how I got the ideas for this book. So so I will say I I uh, did not grow up on a farm. I grew up in suburban uh, suburban Virginia outside of uh, Washington D.C. But my dad's family had a farm in Pennsylvania, which is is really one of the ways that I got interested in farming. And so like a lot of kids who who don't grow up on farms and uh, and get interested in farming, the way that I learned was by apprenticing. So the first thing I did was I got a job on a farm uh, there in Pennsylvania, very close to to uh, to where my my grandma's farm was, and then from there headed out, worked in California for a while, worked on a farm up in Washington State. Then I came back east and I worked on the research farm for uh, Virginia Tech down in Blacksburg, Virginia, and then then my wife and I, we were like, well, are we going to keep apprenticing forever? Are we going to start a farm or what? And so <laughs> nice. we did, we did eventually, uh, we did start a farm on the farm that was, that was in my family up there in Pennsylvania. And do we lost the, the use of that land. And, um, so though after, um, farming for ourselves for a while, we realized there are a few things that we wish we had learned the first time around. So, so we went back to apprenticing while well, we kind of reorganized and figured things out. So we, we, uh, we went off and we uh, apprenticed again in upstate New York. And then we did one more apprenticeship on the coast of Maine, which is how we got to Maine. While we were on the coast of Maine, we saw this farm where we live now, which is in a tiny town called Cornville, which is just north of a slightly larger town called Skowhegan. And right smack in the middle of Maine. And and that was a very serendipitous move for us. We didn't know it at the time, but the, our farm is about half an hour away from the uh, the research farm of Johnny Selected Seeds. And so almost as soon as we moved to this location, we started working for uh, for Johnny Seeds. And in fact, I first my first job, I thought I was just going to go seasonal. I was going to farm full time and then and so I, in the wintertime, I was going to work for Johnny's. In fact, I did that for one winter. I worked in the commercial sales. So I was the guy, when you call Johnny's, I'd say, hello, thank you for calling Johnny's. Um, my name is Andrew, may I take your order? And then um, that, that first winter, 
that we were in Maine, which would have been the winter of 2008-2009, uh -huh. uh, this, this job in the research department at Johnny's opened up to do variety trials. So, And it was also the, the technician. So that position is called a trial technician. One of those job titles that doesn't tell you anything about what the person actually does, so that's why I'm, I'm telling you. But basically, the job is to run trials because, as you, as you know, there are hundreds of varieties of vegetables um, developed every year. And so, so this job opened up for the technician who did um, tomatoes, including some other crops, tomatoes and cucumbers and different things. And nice. tomatoes have always just been kind of my, my favorite crop, kind of my, my power crop the one that I identify with most closely. And so I thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. And, and we are in the middle of getting our farm reestablished and could really use some off-farm income. So so I applied for the job, and sure enough, I got it. And I ended up doing that for the next seven years. And, you know, what what I noticed, okay, so when, when I went to work for Johnny's, I started uh, getting access to these research greenhouses and larger and more professional commercial greenhouses. And... The thing that I noticed, the difference between, say, the kind of farms that I, I learned how to grow on and also the, the, the kind of farm that the typical Johnny's customer had, because I visited lots of those two, the difference between, between the smaller growers, let's say, and the bigger growers was that the smaller growers were um, growing more like the same style as they grew out in the field, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. under, undercover. Right, and I I didn't really know there was an alternative. It's one of those things you, you don't know you don't know there's there's a, an alternative until you see you know the alternative. And right. So I'll say the alternative is uh, more Dutch style greenhouse growing, and it, this is the Dutch have a very long tradition of agriculture in general, but also protected growing. They're they're so far north that uh, I mean. You think that we're far north here in Maine, in the United States. Um, the Dutch are much farther north than we are on the globe, and and they have the benefit of the the jet stream, so they have a they have a milder climate. But in mm -hmm. in terms of light and things like that, you know, in the winter they have even shorter days than we do. And right. so, um, for example, there isn't really even a Dutch tomato uh, field tomato industry. Um, um. They're 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 so far north. Um, other than a few home gardeners, the only tomatoes they grow are in greenhouses. So that, that's that's one of the reasons that the Dutch have, have just advanced so much on this stuff, because that's really the only game for them. Uh, you know, if you want to grow tomatoes in Holland, you're pretty much doing it in a greenhouse. greenhouse. And so I saw this this distinction between these, these larger, more professional growers, many of which who were actually Dutch. I mean, there was more than one greenhouse that I went into. The growers are first-generation Dutch. They're speaking Dutch to each other. They got growers' newspapers in Dutch. There, I mean, they're like really doing the Dutch system. So I just, I just saw um, this this difference where they they just had really different growing styles that I, I would call the greenhouse growing style, the Dutch greenhouse growing style that were that were that were significantly different from. Uh, from the field growing styles that I've been exposed to. Right. And of course they were getting much higher yields and, and were being uh, much more efficient. In fact, if, if I can use an analogy that I, that I did use in the book, uh -huh. w one thing I think is very telling, which is really applicable to small growers here, whether they be urban or um, suburban out in the middle of nowhere, this, this analogy applies to all smaller growers. Okay. And so, uh, one of the things I talk about in the book is how in, uh, 2015, which is the year that we have the most current statistics for, right. but we see this pattern most most years, it plays out like this. Okay, so most years, the United States is the top agricultural exporter in the world. Okay, so 2015, no difference. So 2015, we're number one in the um, ag agricultural exports in the world. And the, wow. the Dutch, most years, are second. Okay, uh -huh. and so what you need to know to put that in perspective is that we're really comparing apples and oranges there because Holland is about two thirds the size of West Virginia. Right. So for, for, for West Virginia sized country to be coming in second uh, in the <laughs> entire world of, I know. of, of uh, agricultural exports. Yeah. And so you say, how are they doing this? How they're doing it is with greenhouses that are ultra ultra efficient and ultra productive because they're they're really good at growing and they they're, they're very focused on efficiency. 
So A is greenhouses, and B is they're focusing on high-value crops, yeah. like the fruit, fruiting vegetables, okay, the, the four crops that I talk about in my book being tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and eggplant, and leafy vegetables, mm-hmm. lettuce, greens, microgreens, and, uh, and herbs, herbs. Yeah. predominantly basil, and also flowers. I should say, uh, you know, flowers can be a great greenhouse crop. crop. It's just not my area of expectation. Of expertise. If I knew more about flowers, I would have I would have loved to write about flowers. I hope somebody writes a book a book about greenhouse, greenhouse flowers. flowers it's, yeah, it's a it's a need. It's not really out there, but but you know my my expertise was those eight crops. And and you know what what I came to notice after doing all of these farm visits, which which was one great thing about the Johnny's job is I got to go on a lot of farm tours. Oh, so I love bad. I love farm tours. Yeah, yeah, and. What I noticed is all the, the big commercial greenhouses, they're almost exclusively focused on those eight crops, right? Tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, eggplant, lettuce, greens, microgreens, and, and herbs, mostly basil. Basil, yeah. And, so, and it's, it's because, uh, well, for one thing, there's year-round demand for all those crops. Yep. Another thing is those are all crops that can't really be stored. You know, all you right. have to you have to have year round production to meet that year round demand, and they also just are are they're worth enough as far as price per pound or however they're sold right. price per unit that they're very reliable returners. You know, if you if you put the investment into a greenhouse, you're you're it's 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 higher higher investment space. You know, it's very precious real estate. Yep. So you need to know you're going to get paid back, and so so it's, so, so those eight crops are. Um, are the ones that are, yeah. are reliable to pay you back. And, One of the, and not, not that others can't. You know, I talk right. a little bit in the book about how to evaluate other crops. Like, you know, let's say you really wanted to grow radishes or carrots or something. Mm-hmm. I, I talk in there about how to evaluate the other crops, but, you know, those are the eight crops that are solid and that also have specific practices developed for, for greenhouse growing. Yeah. When I What I've told people for years is if you want to, you know, actually make money in an urban area, go for the high dollar crops, the specialty crops, because you can make more money with them. Yeah. 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 There you go. And and that was one of the fun things, you know, on all my farm tours, I've been tours in urban areas, suburban areas out in the middle of nowhere and, and everywhere in between. But, but, you know, I, I really think that greenhouse growing is particularly important for urban farms because yeah. Most of the urban farms that I've been to are are on very small plots of land, or right. even on rooftops or something. Yep. And most of the time, they don't have the possibility of expansion, right? If, right. If you're on a rooftop, you can't really extend that. <laughs> exactly. If you're, if you're on a city city block or something, there's there are buildings all around you. So unless unless you're perfectly happy with all of your your um your yields and and don't need any more, the only way to the only way to increase is 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 by um, increasing the productivity of the space yeah. that you already yeah. have, and I think that greenhouses are just one of the best yeah. uh, ways of doing that. Yeah. And I, I should say one term that I I try to to um, popularize in the book is this term protected culture. So I, mm-hmm. I just said greenhouses. I really mean greenhouses and hoop houses. That's why I like this term protected culture. So once once again, this is a this is a European term. It's used a lot in the the European seed industry and and, and just plant industry hoop, in general. Who so I mean, protected, protected culture. culture. Okay. Yes, and and by that they mean greenhouse and hoop house. And I I find that particularly useful because I found with talking to growers and doing talks and things. Sometimes if I say greenhouse, then then unheated growers kind of tune that out, right? Because usually we say greenhouse to mean a heated house, and oh, at, at right. least the people I'm used to say hoop house to mean an unheated structure. And I so, was going to ask you that, actually, what the difference was between a greenhouse and a hoop house. So a hoop house is not heated. We, exactly. Oh, okay. And so, so yeah, we, we can have a very specific way to say, you know, heat with board or not heat. But, in fact, that's why that's why I wanted it to be in the title of the book. So both we say the greenhouse and hoop house growers handbook in the subtitle is organic vegetable production using protected culture. Perfect. And then, then our sub subtitle is best practice practices for the eight most profitable crops, which I already nice. m- mentioned, you know, I wanted the pe- people to know it's not like an encyclopedic guide to growing everything under right. the sun. You know, really, it really focuses on in on the eight things that I think 
people should be focusing on. And just just that selection of crops right there is is a nudge for for people, right? You... So a lot of our listeners are in urban areas, and we've already established that you need to go more dense in an urban area uh, in order and, and grow higher quality crops or higher uh, value crops. Uh, what other differences are there in growing vegetables in fields as opposed to growing in a greenhouse? Yeah, that's that's a good question. It, one of the biggest differences is just since in in the field you're getting rain on the leaves of the crops. Oh, yeah. Might not seem like such a big deal, but pretty much all of the foliar diseases across crops are promoted by having wet leaves. And so... I would say that one of the biggest advantages of growing in, in protected culture is keeping the leaves dry. And so, and that, that's the kind of thing you know, people don't always pick up on or pick up on right away because it's kind of an intangible of, uh, of, of, of protected growing. People think, you know, the things that come to mind when they think about um, the, the, what's good about protected growing is having a longer season and being warmer, right? Right, exactly. What, Whereas that's really huge when you think about plant disease uh, from a plant disease standpoint is simply by growing your crops under cover, they're, they're, you're going to have less of those foliar diseases. Right. You know, the late blights, the early blights, the, all the blights and, and different things In general, uh, yeah. that, that affect the, le- the leaves keeps, of tomatoes. So Probably keeps pests out too. Yes. Yeah, you, you can, especially if you net or something like that, which, which I do talk about. I think that the most honest thing to say about pests in relation to uh, protected growing is that chances are some of your pests are going to be better. There are some pests that are less likely to come into a greenhouse. Right. You may get some other pests. There are different pests that are more likely to come into a greenhouse. But either way, growing in a, in a, in protected culture does give you more control over the situation. So you're more likely to be able to do something about the pests that you do have. Yeah. Perfect. So you have a chapter here. Chapter 9 is on tomatoes. Chapter 10 is on cucumbers. Chapter 11 is on peppers. Uh, 12 is on eggplants. And then uh, the leafy crops as well. And in your tomato chapter, you touch on a concept that I'd like you to kind of flesh out for us a little bit. It's called bricks. Can you tell us what that is and why it's important? That's B-R-I-X. Yes, that is a good, great question. So bricks, bricks is is simply a measure of how how uh, many soluble solids are in a liquid. Mm-hmm. And so the 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 use um, in in relation to t- tomatoes and a lot of other crops too, but talking about tomatoes is that if you uh, squeeze the juice out of a tomato, for example, uh, the higher the, the amount of the higher the measure of bricks. So the higher the, the amount of soluble solids, essentially in tomato juice, you, you take a tomato, squeeze it, um, and, uh, and and bricks is measured by a very simple instrument called a refractometer. Mm-hmm. In fact, it, it's the same thing that your mechanic might measure your antifreeze. Uh, oh right, of course. The effectiveness of your antifreeze on, yeah, and, and it's not the same one. So if, if you're if you're if you're a uh, if you're a shade tree mechanic. The one for cars is calibrated differently. You can't just you can't right. just run out and take the one for for antifreeze out and use it on your tomatoes. But but um, in tomatoes it's different than for antifreeze. In tomatoes, a higher a higher reading of soluble solids corresponds to more sugar yeah. um, and also in flavor compounds in in the tomato juice. And so it's it's kind of a standardizable way of measuring how sweet and how flavorful tomatoes are. Mm-hmm. That also goes to the nutrient density of it, does it not? Yes, it does. In fact, there's there's a lot of work being done about using the t- tomato juice and also plant saps of mm. um, of you know actually taking the um, taking the juice out of the the stems and squeezing the juice out of the plant itself and and measuring how healthy the plant is and and nutrient density because that, that stuff tends to go hand in hand. It, you know, it's it's a happy happy coincidence that. Flavor, nutrient density, and sweetness are all all, uh, all correlated, and so that is a nice way and, and, and an important way too, because it, it it can be used to monitor plant health. It's you know very very yeah. broadly speaking, 
if you're if you're measuring the plant sap and the the bricks is higher, your your plants are healthier and more nutrient dense. And lower means lower or also trending lower. You know that that's right, a very exactly. a very thing, a very important thing in yeah. growing. It's not just what is the reading right now. It's to take multiple readings, and if you know if your bricks is gradually dropping. Um, it can be an important indication that your plants are becoming less healthy and also probably also less tasty. But but um, so you would want to remedy both of those things. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. You know, and there's a chapter here, chapter eight on grafting. So I run a fruit tree program here in the Phoenix metropolitan area. And, uh, you know, and I've sold fruit trees for a couple of decades now. And fruit trees are grafted. But this notion of grafting tomatoes maybe or cucumbers tell us about that absolutely sure it's the same practice as um as as we do on fruit trees mm -hmm. it's just it's a much more recent development to to apply it to herbaceous plants like you can do it i've actually done grafting on tomatoes peppers cucumbers and eggplants wow and it's the same thing it's it's i i, I love grafting for one thing, just just the the cutting the plants apart and splicing them back together, that just sort of stokes my inner plant nerd, which is really <laughs> I what I that. am at, at heart. And so some people some people hate grafting. It's you know it's kind of tedious. You know you're you're working on these tiny little plants and you know, it is it is a little bit tedious. But yeah. but between between making my inner plant nerd happy and the huge benefits that I've seen with grafting. Uh, I got really into grafting, and and, and it was also my job. I, I did yeah. all the grafting for the jo the the grafted tomato trials in particular. Actually, we messed around with all those crops. The the most the most useful thing I want to say for your listeners right away uh -huh. is that the root stocks for tomatoes right now are are fantastic. They have root stocks that can resist most of the common soil-borne diseases. Oh, nice! And they also they also lend a much higher level of vigor to the plants. For example, I don't have any known soil borne diseases in my in my um, in my hoop houses or greenhouses. Uh -huh. uh, I'll probably get one one day. But right now I, I don't have any that I'm aware of, but I still graft my plants just for the yield boost. In fact, in in my trials at Johnny's, I, I try grafted plants every which way. You know, I tried grafted plants versus single leader plants. I tried double leader grafted plants versus single leader you know, the same density of single leader ungrafted plants and and pretty much any way you slice it um, i was getting somewhere between a 30 and 50 percent yield boost wow. on tomatoes with grafting which with grafting. you think about it that's that's huge um oh yeah to, you know what what's easier to, to graft or to build 50 percent more, more protected plants. space you know yeah. to me it's a no-brainer it's it's easier to graft and even if it's not your thing to cut your plants up and slice them back together they're getting to be more available um, you're, you can now buy grafted plants through the mail from some places. I think it would be a great business for somebody if somebody got good at grafting yeah. to to sell grafted plants to other growers locally. And and, and, and I mean that's not that's not my idea. Uh, there are people already doing yeah. that. Um, yeah, exactly. nurseries and things like that, wow. um, selling grafted plants locally. Yeah. So so yeah, the grafting grafting is neat because it's a it's a completely natural technique. It's just taking a, taking advantage of the plant's ability to heal, heal itself to itself yeah and yeah if occasionally if you snap off a tomato plant in the field particularly on an overcast day in the middle of some cool weather if you put it back occasionally you can get it to heal back to itself and oh, so what nice. you're doing is you're just you're just it doesn't involve any chemicals or anything you're just mm -hmm. taking the plant and getting it to heal to another plant and um, right. so that's that's why I think it's, it's such a great technique for, for nice. growers, especially organic growers, because you can you can boost the disease resistance without using any chemicals. Any chemicals at all? Wow, how cool is that? So I'm gonna I'm gonna shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you might have learned from it. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, I would say an example that I could give of that is is uh, when we started out uh, our farm. We, we really started out growing the way that we had learned. So we had basically started out growing the way that I'm, I'm trying to get people uh, not to grow. Um, <laughs> a, a real, a re, yeah, you know, I, we've been doing this long enough. Our, our farming practices have really 
evolved along with along with this the stuff that I've learned. Uh-huh. And I can say there would be no book if I if I weren't farming at the same time because really what I was doing is while I was learning stuff at Johnny's, I was just I was just a sponge, and that was that mm. was great. It was just fascinating because I I had I had access to just a lot of plant experts and growers and things who wanted to to help me because they knew if, if I could pick the right varieties and also help growers that that I would I would do a better job in in my job at Johnny's. And that was the other that was another important part of my job at Johnny's was troubleshooting growers questions. If if growers called in at Johnny's and had problems with the, any of the crops that I was working on, they would send them over to me. And and so um, that's another reason why I wrote the book because I felt like I was just hearing the same questions over and over again. Yep. And so that that told me um, well, we have this saying at the farmer's market, we certainly didn't make it up. It's if you get the same question over and over again, yeah. time to make a sign. You know, <laughs> if you right, ask exactly. what, what price the carrots are 20 times a day, you should probably make a sign telling people what price the carrots are so you don't have to keep answering that question. And so after, you know, after getting asked, well, you know, wh- what daytime temperature should I grow my tomatoes at? <laughs> you know, a hundred times I thought, actually, I, I literally had this thought, I thought, Somebody should really write all this stuff down. I, thought, I had that thought several times before. Finally, I was like, yeah, maybe I should do that. Uh, and that, that is what, what led to the book. Yeah. But back to your question about um, you know, something that we failed at. When we started our farm, we were, we were growing the way that I'm, I'm trying to get people not to grow. Uh, a really good example, a very concrete example of that is we, we have some, uh, some 30 by 48 uh, hoop houses. Uh-huh. And when we started out, we were growing tomatoes at the way that we had been shown and the way that a lot of smaller growers um, grow them. Just like in the field, they plant a single row of tomatoes down a bed. And I think we were planting them a single row with, with the plants about a foot apart. And so in a 30 by 48 hoop house, we were doing five, five of those single rows. Mm-hmm. And I, I believe that's uh, 200 tomato plants. And so, yeah, 40 by 5 is 200. Mm-hmm. And so, the, like I, I mentioned, the real fundamental of, of this Dutch greenhouse growing system, in fact, if, if you told me that your receiver was going to cut out in a minute and I, could, I had nothing else, I could tell people one thing, I uh-huh. would say, grow more, plant more densely. More density, So luckily, yep. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, so, the, 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 you know, the basis is, it's obvious if if you can cram more plants into a given area, you're obvi- you're going to get a higher yield as long as you can keep them healthy. And so, mm-hmm. I just went to greenhouse after greenhouse, and they were all planted so much more densely than we were, and they were all pretty standardized. They were all growing these double rows. Okay, so the way that they got more plants into a given area is instead of planting a single row down a bed, they were planting two rows, and most of them were planting two rows that were two feet apart. And so I'm going to throw that out there for your listeners. Uh-huh. That there's there's different spaces for every crop, but you know this example I'm talking about tomatoes in our hoop houses. And so what we went from was a single row of tomatoes with the, the plants a foot apart to a double row of tomatoes with the rows two feet apart with plants a foot apart in the row. And... At first, I was a little bit nervous about this. I, I wondered if I wondered if that dense of a spacing only applied to bigger greenhouses that had heat and ways to dry out the mm-hmm. air like heating. And so it was a bit of a leap of faith for me. I had to try it just being a plant nerd. Right. And also the, the, the potential of rewards were too great. You know, I thought I saw the kind of yields that these commercial growers were getting. Plus, I just thought, yeah, can can I double my number of plants? Um, and, and what and happened? So I, I baby steps that I went, I went from five single rows to four double rows. When I saw how well four double rows worked out, I think I did an additional uh, intermediary step where I did four double rows and, and two single rows on uh-huh. the outsides, on the edges of the, the hoop house. All right. But then I realized, wait a minute, four double rows and two single rows is the same as five double rows. So I just went, by the end, you know, what we've ended up on, our preferred spacing is five double rows in a, in a, um, a hoop house for a total of 400 plants. And 
So wow. we went from getting about a ton of tomatoes. So we would get about a ton of tomatoes out of a 30 by 48 hoop house right. at our old spacing to getting, we went, now we get more like two tons of tomatoes out of that same space. Wow. And so that's, that's a very concrete example. Yeah. And the, the reason that I bring that up when you ask about a failure is that we, we certainly didn't fail or go out of business, but it also, our, I felt like our hoop house growing at first was just not living up to our expectations. You know, yeah. we put, we bought the hoop houses, put, you know, to put our sweat equity into putting them up mm-hmm. and we were like, yeah, this is great. Things are earlier, but it's just, we just don't have the yields the way that we really needed them to be because we were commercially farming. And so I would say making all these changes really took our hoop house growing from being, you know, mildly successful to successful and yeah. profitable, wow. which is what was important. Oh, yeah, no kidding. No kidding. And you could consider that your biggest success too, I'll bet. Yeah, that that was a real... Well, the the book I'm the book I'm very happy about too, since yeah. since I have only had it for about two weeks now. But yeah, that that right there. I mean, just boosting the production because we we applied the same principles to cucumbers. I mean, the most typical thing that we would do is we built these two hoop houses right next to each other, uh-huh. partially due to our, our own market. That the farmers market that we moved into here in Central Maine, there were people doing protected culture greens. So we do have a very short season. So right. I feel like. I feel like um, extending the season is really important for, for farms around here. And so um, there are people doing extended season greens, but there was nobody extending the season on those fruiting, fruiting vining Plants. crops. Yeah. And, and so what we typically, we built these two hoop houses right next to each other, and typically we would fill one with tomatoes and one with cucumbers, and we would just switch them back and forth as our kind of lame crop rotation. I mean, it's better than, it was not a great crop rotation, but it was better than... Better than nothing. Yeah, 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 better than nothing. So yeah, so what drives you? Well, there's definitely a few things. I I definitely have a love for just the just agriculture. I like I like the kind of work, and it's it's very particular. And I like working in greenhouses. I mean, you got a nice, you know, it's warmer than whatever it is oh, outside. Yeah. I guess <laughs> in the middle of summer, it could be a little too hot. Definitely not for everybody. My, in fact, my wife, she says it's. Um, she says that the greenhouse work is too much like orchard work, which is true because you're, you know, you're going through and you're, you're, you're pruning and you're, you're, yeah. you're trellising. And in fact, I have a friend who has an apple orchard and we, we talk about um, pruning sometimes because you know, it means it's the same principle. You're, right, you're exactly. directing the growth of the plant. And yeah. so for me to go into my hoop house and, and do the whole hoop house, I feel like, okay, you know, I've, I've, I've done what I need to do. I've set things right for the day. I can, I can move on. So I like the work. I also think it's really important to have a, a safe and healthy food system. And I also just I just think that locally produced agriculture is, is very important. And that's yeah. that's why I think I think urban agriculture is brilliant. You know? You yeah. you grow where the majority of the people are. Just it's just a great idea. And so, you know, somebody told me something the other day that they said that the value of the American food market was roughly Eight hundred billion dollars, and you know you can quibble with the numbers, but this is probably roughly um, close. I, I, this sounds like it's probably roughly accurate. They said American food market's about eight hundred billion dollars, but the locally produced food market is about eight billion dollars. So that's one percent. So wow. I figure it's almost an unlimited growth industry. It right? really is, isn't it's it? Grown, yeah, and so so that's you know that's one thing. If you said that's one of the changes that I would love to see in the world is for more, more of the food that people eat be produced closer Close to, to home. Them. And I, I think urban agriculture has a big, has a big part to play in that because yeah. our country is, is more and more urban. So, I, I mean, everybody could get on in on this. <laughs> you know, we need more people growing close to cities, chucking the food into the cities. We need more people growing in cities, delivering the food to their neighbors. Yeah. And so, that's why I just think that protected growing is so important because basically when when you extend the season on a small farm, you're you're extending local food. So whether it's in the middle of the city or in the middle of nowhere, you're doing the same thing. And and that was just that was what we saw when I was at Johnny's. There was just so much interest in um, extending the season because right. you know the demand is there. We had people saying, "Oh, we we love your produce." We wish you could buy your tomatoes 12 months of the 12 year. And I was never exactly. going to go to heating a greenhouse 12 months a year. But 
you know, now we're in a situation with growers having the demand, and they just have to figure out how to meet it, whether it's increasing productivity with a greenhouse or extending the season with a greenhouse or hoop house. You know, I feel like greenhouse or hoop houses have a big role to play in um, increasing that local food supply either way. Perfect. Perfect. Say, so I'm all about education, and I got to know, is there a book that's been influential for you in this process in your life? Yeah, there is. I thought about that a little bit. So there's this, this book called Greenhouse Tomatoes, Lettuce, and Cucumbers, and it's out of print, but you can find it. Um, it is available. There's so many book services these days, you oh, know, yeah. for buying out of print books and things like that. It, it's still available if you go look at it. It's by Witwer and Hanma, W-I-T-T-W-E-R and H-O-N-M-A. In fact, I do reference it in, 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 in my book. book. Uh, there's a references section, and I, I do make reference to it. So if people are checking out my book, it, they can they can look at it there. And um, one of the reasons that I like this book is it's I believe it's from the late 70s, and it's it's interesting reading it is kind of like going in a time machine. I know it's cool. When um, I do that since since that book was published. Um, a lot of the big greenhouses have gone um, hydroponic just because right, hydroponics is, is, is a simpler. Yeah, so the interesting thing about reading this book is because is that it was published right before everything went hydroponic. Yeah. <laughs> and so because it's it's kind of hard. That's, that's actually one of the other reasons that I, I wrote the book. I do feel like uh, in the book I kind of focus on from the ground up. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing I'm really into is plant management techniques, is pruning, trellising, you know, using different temperatures to right. get the plant to do what you want. Yeah. But I did also, I, I am personally a soil grower, and so I wanted to also talk about soil growing uh, a bit. And so this book was just was interesting for me because it's, it's one of the last texts that I could find that really um, talked, talked a lot about soil, gro- soil growing too. And so, mm. so that is an interesting book if cool. people can get their hands on it. But I, di- I did try to sort of take take what they were talking about 40 years ago and, and update it in, in, in my own, in my own book. Beautiful. And and that was definitely influential, which is why I wanted to make sure and, and reference it in, in yeah. my own book. Perfect. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Well, you know, my advice is that the big, is that really the techniques for protected growing are scalable. Um, mm, you know, yes. the, the, the laws of nature and the way that plants relate to them mm-hmm. doesn't matter if you're in a hundred square foot greenhouse or a hundred acre greenhouse you know that the the the, the, uh, the response is the same and so yeah. really to be a good grower there's nothing like spending time with your plants and there's there's really there are understandings that will come just from just from spending time with them and things things like my book will help you understand what's going on but you'll develop a deeper understanding the more the more that time you spend with your plants and the more time you spend growing. So I guess that's it is don't, you know, don't be afraid to try new things. Have a lot of suggestions. You know, I figure from the growers that I've seen, uh-huh. you know, some of them are doing some of the things in my book, but I feel like very few growers are doing all the things that I talk about in my book. And, and the contrast to that is that the big growers, you go visit the big growers and they're all doing all the things in my book. You know, big growers are not going to buy my book. Because they're already doing all of it. They right. just, they consider it, you know, you ask them about what they're doing. They're like, yeah, this is what we do. You know, <laughs> and it's just, it's this whole body of knowledge that I feel like smaller growers are, for the most part, not even aware of. And so that, yeah. that's why I really wanted to write the book is, is people don't have to take every single idea that I, that I write about in the book. Uh, you know, I say it's like an a la carte menu. You read about the dense spacing. You read about the temperature. You read about the ventilation. You know, maybe you really don't like the dense spacing, but you can um, get some tips on temperature management from me that can still be helpful. And so that's what I like about it is it's, it's customizable. You know, one yeah. one thing I like to say is that there are as many ways to farm as there are farmers. You know, many ways to grow as there are growers. Yeah. And that's one of the things that keeps it interesting to me is that people people are always doing stuff that I, I think, oh, you can't do that, and then I'll go find somebody who's having great success doing exactly. you know, something I thought would never work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I tell so, people all the time, never say never in gardening. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So so well, that's why, you know, I feel like it's a very customizable, you know, my book has, has a lot of ideas that people can just take some and leave some, 
and really, it's just, you know, growing is a matter of style and passion, yeah. and people can take some of the ideas and just leave the ones that don't appeal, and they can, their production will still benefit. They don't, it's not right. like, it's not like a program, you know, you have to do everything in here, it's mm-hmm. not going to work. It's like, read it, see what appeals to you, experiment, experiment. and yeah. end up with something. Amen to that. Like, well, thank you so much for joining us on the show and sharing your experience with us today, Andrew. It has been a treat getting to chat with you. Great. Well, that's yeah. This has really been fun. You know, I, I didn't really say much about the magazine. Um, it is uh, our magazine is uh, called Growing for Market Magazine. is uh-huh. is really designed for direct market growers, and so like farmers market, CSA. And so, if people haven't seen the magazine, it is a great resource. We try to focus on growing tips, uh, marketing, and the business of farming. And that's In fact, a big I set up a coupon. I set up a coupon code for your uh, listeners. Perfect. So if you're whether you're whether you're already a subscriber or not, it works either for anyone. Uh, you can go to the website, which is www.growingformarket.com, and the code is Urban. U R B A N. Nice. nice. Um, it's actually not case sensitive, so you can it could, you could put in all caps or lower. It's, just, it's not picky. Put in Urban, and you can get twenty percent off um, any subscription. We have a digital subscriptions we have print subscriptions we have subscriptions where you get digital and print so oh, nice it's growingformarket.com so just g r o w i n g f o r m a r k e t.com and the other thing is if you do subscribe at any level in fact we have a digital subscription is 30 bucks and so if you got 20% off that would be 24 bucks so you could subscribe and try it out for as little as uh, 24 bucks uh, subscribers get 20% off all the books. And so you could get, if you subscribed, you would get 20% off, off my book. Or we, we, one of the other things that we do at the magazine is we have a very carefully curated selection of uh, market farming and uh-huh. growing books. You know, we don't, we don't have a huge ah, catalog. We just good. carry the ones that we think are really relevant. In fact, if, if you, if you uh, haven't talked to this guy, you really should. Um, there's another book that I think your readers would be interested in called Compact Farms by Josh Volk, who, who his book is also just came out here in February. That's the other reason that it's on my mind. Yeah, we and did. it is a really neat book. Yeah. Because it focuses on he talks about farm plans for farms that are five acres or less. Right. Yeah, we've had and Josh so on the show. He, so. Oh, okay. All right. I well, well, great because his. His is another like his book just came to mind as one that would would probably appeal. So I'm so glad you've talked to Josh because yeah. I I love his book. Oh yeah, yeah. and um and uh, yeah, that's perfect. another a good one too. Perfect. perfect. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. The book, the Greenhouse and Hoop House Growers Handbook, is available through Chelsea Green and at your local bookstore. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org backslash one drop farm. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Greg Peterson here, and I want to thank you for listening to the Urban Farm Podcast. We wouldn't be able to keep doing these great shows without you. So as a token of my appreciation, I'd like to offer you access to a list of our top 10 episodes I personally find most inspiring. If you enjoy the Urban Farm Podcast, but don't have time to listen to everyone, then you will love this list. Although all our guests have great information to offer, if you are short on time, these 10 are must-listens. To get access to the top 10 most inspiring podcast episodes, text FARMER to 44222. That's FARMER to 44222. And enjoy listening. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.